following um, interview was conducted for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on, fri on Friday, April the 27th, 2007. Uh, the inter being interviewed is Professor Felix Haas. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, and it took place in, uh, the, in one of the Carrollson Mass Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early years. Well, I came to the United States in 1939, just before the Second World War. Uh, I was born in Vienna, Austria, I left there in 38, in the summer of 38, and I spent a year in England, essentially waiting for my American visa to get ready, because it was, there was a waiting list time at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came in the fall of 39, and I came to the United States. And then I, in late 42, December 42, I was drafted into the American Army, because Non-citizens were subject to the draft if they were permanent residents. And so from 39 to late 42, I had jobs in New Jersey, I had jobs. Uh, and, uh, and I worked in a garment factory, and then I worked in a, in a smelter, actually, and then smelter for a while. And then I, then I was drafted in the Army, and I was in the Army from uh, essentially January 1st, 43, until I got out in 46, and uh, yeah. when I was in the Army, I became a citizen because when you were in the Army, this, the, the process of becoming a citizen was speeded up. So I remember becoming a citizen when I was stationed at Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. I, it was, uh, in some sense, an amusing experience because I, I went, my, my two witnesses were my sergeant and my first sergeant. And I, when we got to the court, we had to wait for a while. They felt that they were doing me a favor. I had to entertain them. And I took them to the saloon next door. By the time we got back to the court, I was worried about how good a witness it would make, but it worked out okay. I became a citizen. And then I was discharged in 1946. And in 46, I had never finished high school in Austin. In 46, I applied to MIT because I had an anchor in Cambridge. Massachusetts, and MIT took me, even though I had never finished high school, just on the basis of tests, which was, for which I will always be grateful. From then on, my life was easy. Beginning in 46, my life was easy. I was a student at MIT from 46 to 52, a bachelor's degree in physics, a master's degree in mechanics, and a PhD in mathematics in 52. And then I ended up as a research instructor at Princeton. And so I was there till I was there until fifty five. Uh, that was for a, for a young mathematician this particular instructorship was a, the most valued prize, I would call it Henry Birchard Fine Instructor, which was the most desirable thing for a young mathematician to do it at that stage. Uh, while I met, met at MIT I met my wife Violet was a graduate student in mathematics. And uh, as a matter of fact, my, my second wife, who, who I married after Violet died, introduced me to Violet at MIT. I went in both of them. They were all students there in the 40s. And then I, and then I taught at Princeton for a while, and then I moved west, late in the campus history, but I moved west, and then ended up in Indiana, in Purdue. I accepted a job in the summer of 61, came in on January 62. And my first job was head of the Division of, head of, the division of Mathematical Sciences. Can I interrupt you for a second? Could we just go back a little bit? Where were your, your parents when they came over? Were you living in Massachusetts? Is that your home? Your early years were spent in? No, oh. I was by myself. Oh. I came over by myself. Oh, okay, okay. And yeah. so you, do you have any relatives here at all? or? Well, my, my, uncle, my, I had an uncle and aunt who facilitated my coming to England, then facilitated, uh, no, did not, they were not responsible for coming to the United States. I had some people give me affidavits or support who were not related to me. But then I, at that stage, in order to come here, there was the government wanted assurance that you would not be an indigent, indigent. So I had 
two women gave me affidavits of support, which was considered a formality. I was not going to be depending on the position of way of getting a visa. And then I... Okay. And then I... Did you stay with them? Or no, no, no. no. And uh, uh, had dinner with each of them once. And that, that was, no, I didn't, that was support sure. you know, the dumb is a, they're taking a little risk to help the young person. Mm -hmm. And then I... Uh, but your early years, you were, were you, how old were you came, when you came over? I was 18. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and, I, and I came by myself. But at that time, I could not have still in England. By the time I came out of the army, they had come, they had come to the United States, to Cambridge. My uncle was a, at that time, a graduate student at Harvard. discharge and you came, then you came back and yeah, I, mean, I, had not, I actually enjoyed myself in the army for a number of reasons. First of all, for me, the moving from what I was doing in the Jordan to the army was an improvement in my living standard. And then I had, uh, because I was motivated because of Hitler to, to, to participate in the war. So it was a balance of a very pleasant experience. And uh, I got out in uh, 46 and then at that time I had Hines. June 46, and actually in six years I did a bachelor's, master's, and PhD degree, and got out. And I rushed because I felt old, I felt I had lost time because I hadn't, I had, had never finished high school, I felt I, I, I felt I had to catch up. Uh, now when I became a dean here in, in, in 63, at age 42, I felt I had made up for the time. Very good. So tell us, then go back to what you started. Then you, you were, uh, when you came, where had you been prior to coming to Purdue? I was, okay, I was at Princeton. Okay. And when I was from Princeton, I moved as chairman of the mathematics department at Wayne State. Okay. And uh, in 61, Purdue had a crisis in the mathematics department. It's ancient history. Huh? The department was in a fight with the dean. Half the people, most distinguished people, had left. Uh, the, the department had been transferred from the Center School of, of Science, Education, and Humanities into the School of Engineering because of that fight. The, uh, the heads of the engineering schools, a group went to see President Hofstede to say something had to be done about mathematics. And uh, so Hofstede got upon an outside committee, chaired by a name called Gerald Mulcahy, a man by the name of Saunders. Lane, who knew me, 
and son of Martin told Hoff is that I was the right man for this job to take over the mathematics department. And so when I came, I came with, uh, with a certain amount of bargaining power, and uh, I was promised uh, in substantial increases for the department. Uh, actually, I was promised $200,000 a year in increases for three years in a row to rebuild the department, but also to, to, to worry more about applied mathematics or computing. Hopefully, was interested in that. Mm -hmm. Am I coming no, to yeah, my No, no, go, the, the, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. We want, we want to hear okay. experiences at Purdue. Okay, that's okay, great. So. Yeah. And when I came here, so I started rebuilding the department. I Both from a student standpoint as well as faculty? Well, uh, because the, the, the two go together. Sure, you need right. to, um, you know, academic administration consists of three parts. First of all, you have to get the resources for what you're doing. And secondly, you have to use quality and control to ensure that the resources are not wasted. You get the best possible people. And thirdly, you have to shape the direction of, of what's happening. And in order to get resources, you have to do a good job for the students and the other departments. So one of the things I did, I, I was head of mathematics, I went to all the other schools on the campus. I said, what would you like mathematics to do for you? Yeah, because I've been in a climate where the university was supportive of having the mathematics built. And I think that's true of every level of administration. You know, the, if you think of a university as a place Finally, there was a place for scholars and young people for mutual benefit. The definition is to do to, by the philosopher Whitehead. Then uh, academic administration provides the resources for that meeting. It uses the quality control and it shapes the direction. Okay. Now, there was, I, I did the, uh, uh, at that first year, I hired 21 people for the department. I hired 21 people, I must have made 80 offers of appointment. I got some good people for the first year. And then I, I decided that I really, the department... And, excuse me, and you were in a recitation, that was where the head building, okay. But I decided the department was getting too large, and I also felt that the areas of statistics and computer science were sufficiently different from mathematics that they needed uh, some kind of separate identity. And we then, within a year, formed three departments. Initially, the departments didn't have separate budgets. The budget was still one that the whole division had. But the curricula was set by three different groups of people because the, they all didn't have competence in all these areas to set curricula. They set a, a computer science department, a statistics department, a mathematics department. A year and a half later, they were formally made departments by the, by the, by the trustees got their own projects, but that was the beginning of it, for six I did mathematics. And I started, I got some, uh, I got, uh, I feel that I've, if I've any, done anything for the university, I've brought good people here, because that's the best thing you can do for the university. I got Sam Compton for mathematics, and Shanti Gupta for statistics, and they, they were the right people. As, uh, as was Kuna Kura, I had later for geosciences. These were very good people, very solid people. You know, decent people, smart people, you know, And then, uh, actually, within a year or so after I came here, President Hofti had said he wanted to form a new school of science, but I'd like to be dean. And initially I rejected the job because I felt that I hadn't finished my job in mathematics yet. But Having been here just a short period of time, yeah. perhaps. Uh, they came back to me another six months later and said again that they wanted a new school and they only wanted it. I, in fact, I was willing to accept the deanship. So I became dean technically on June 63. July 1st, 63, the new school was open. They initially had the departments of uh, physics, chemistry, the biological sciences, mathematics, computer science statistics. And uh, I think that was a very happy period of my life. I enjoyed being dean. I enjoyed, uh, I 
enjoyed uh, the all aspects of the job. I enjoyed dealing with the people, getting good people, and. Uh, How were it? What uh, talking about that? What, what fundraising were you? Did that yeah, was we did some fundraising, but in all fairness, the amount of fundraising done in universities, private fundraising has increased tremendously in the last 75 years. Certainly as late as 1950, public universities in fact did no outside fundraising. Uh, they and depended on the state? They depended on the state. And uh, gradually this increased. Uh, and, uh, but you know, it, it always, in, in some sense, Your fundraising is related to a clear vision you have of what you want to do. And, you know, yeah, if you know what you want to do, it, it becomes easy to explain to outsiders where they ought to help you. Now, one of the early fundraising efforts here was this particular building which is sitting for uh, a four and a half million dollar building. It's for cheaper in those days. But I got a million and a half from the National Science Foundation for the building. Those days, the National Science Foundation still supported building. They stopped that program a few years ago. You can have a close window. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the uh, so I got that. We got that building for the for the course. So we got a million and a half towards a four and a half million dollar building for National Science Foundation for this building for the mathematics building, which was completed about '68 or something, and. Uh, I did some fundraising, and I always had this, and uh, it was really relas related to what I tried to explain to people who, what we were doing and why. And uh, I. Uh, were there any specific, what were some of the challenges when you were the dean that uh, you do recall? Well, I mean, I, I, I really. I had to make some changes. Uh, I was unhappy with two of the departments who remain unnamed, and uh, I felt that a change had to be made. I was I found it hard to do this, but I never felt. I always believed that you should not micromanage a university. You leave units alone. If you can't trust the people there, what to do? should make a change in the leadership. You can't, shouldn't interfere. And then was, then another thing was it became fairly clear that uh, that uh, in order for us to play the book with the role of the, of the science school in the kind of university that Purdue was, that we needed some development in the ge geology, in the, which we didn't have. And I think it's... Uh, 68 or 67, I guess. Uh, I discussed it with President Halsby. But, but all these things I've done, if I've done anything, but not if it's possible at any stage, without the support of the president and the vice president for my reporting group, who are always sympathetic and friendly. I, found, I never found any, any, any resistance or anything. And uh, I decided that the need of the department is general sciences and I was going to but I didn't want a traditional geology department just concerned concern with rocks I wanted I, I like I have a concept that you want departments to be as large as possible because the more departments you have the more barriers you erect between people interacting but just that the other department of biological sciences as in zoology or botany or whatever back was the important department of what they call geosciences, which is now called Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. They put in the geophysicists, the geochemists, the geologists, the meteorologists, the paleontologists, a variety of people, even bunch of geography, a variety of people concerned with the Earth and surrounding atmosphere. And they worked out very well, I think. Mm -hmm. They just had their 40s, I was like, at the 40th anniversary, I was there, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there I brought in something named Guna Kularar in 68, it was a marvelous uh, geochemistry, really understood what needed to be done, and uh, it's 
so I, as you know, the as I said, I enjoyed the whole aspect of being a dean. I enjoyed the getting the resources. I enjoyed the quality control. Uh, I'm, if I made enemies in my career, they were always always over the issue of quality control. When you tell a dean that he cannot keep somebody because the person really isn't good enough for the university, that that, that violates people's ego and it's. But that, that's that's the only thing that's over my first first making enemies over in the university and anything. And then I uh, and I and then particularly enjoyed the, the interaction with the faculty. I've always thought of myself as a faculty member. I mean, I've been a member of the mathematics department all the time I was here. I've taught a course every year that I've been at, every semester that I've been at Purdue until a year ago. And uh, my roots have remained in the mathematics department. Uh, but these are my friends. That's your base. That's right. This is your base. These, these are my friends. And uh, so, and, and I mentioned earlier that I, I think I've brought in some very good people. And, and that's really what you do. You bring in very good people and then leave them alone. Now, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll not, it's, unless they want to interact with you, and they will only, and really they only usually, two, there are one or two reasons why they interact with you. One is because they want the resources of some endeavor or other. And the other one is because they're looking for father image, or in the case of a mother image. Uh, they want to brag to somebody about the success they've had. And some of my fondest memories of deans were when I would sit in my office on the dance floor. And say, Michael Osman came in and just done this analysis of the second virus. And he pointed out that the common sinks, the first and the second virus, and he said, those must go back to the early stage of evolution. You know, it was, they enjoyed the, that kind of interaction with people. Enjoyed, enjoyed, in order to be a good university administrator, you have to take pleasure in the success of others. Then now, and then you moved on from... Well, from I, was, I was department and I became dean. Right. Uh -huh. And then my dean's office originally was an engineering administration until this building was finished. And uh, I worked with minimal administration. I had an associate dean, Bill Fuller, who you may know. And Bill and I each taught a course. So actually the, the cost of the School of Science of administration were two one and one third, two thirds of Fuller and two thirds of me. That was the total administrative cost plus some secretaries. And I've always believed in minimal administration. You want to keep administrative costs down, that enables you to have resources for hiring good people and supporting them. And, uh, and I pursued this, for instance, when I was provost, I put, I put the School of Nurses under the same dean as the School of Pharmacy, the School of Health Sciences. I didn't want three deeds. I wanted a minimum number of administration to save cost. That's good point. How did you happen? Did they come? How did you get the? It, that's that when Hanson came, isn't that correct? When you yeah. were the provost, yeah. they had, um, um, did they come to you, or how did that come about? Yeah, well, Hanson first brought us in a man of Rob Robinson from North Carolina. Right. There were some difficulties with Robinson. And uh, then uh, Hanson asked me to become provost. And uh, that was a very rewarding experience. I, I, uh, the trick for being a provost is to know what, the pre what decisions the president wants to make and what decisions he doesn't want to be involved in. And if you have a modicum of sensitivity, it's usually not too hard to tell. And then you take to the president those things where you think they expect that he would want to make the decision. The rest you don't bother him. And, uh, and uh, I think I worked very well with Charles. I also worked very well with the business office, actually. I, I'm not one of those who blames the business office for all the problems. I think that uh, it's the job of Excite the business office over the things that you want to do academically. If you convince them that what you want to do is going to build a great university, it's going to be good for the university, they'll go along with it. They, 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 
Exactly. And, uh, when now, when, when the provost, you had all, that was like the uh, over all the academic department. Uh, yeah, all the provost schools. essentially on the for the researcher just explain the yeah the president Hanson essentially everything reported either to Fred Ford or to myself. Now the the, the few the exception was intercollegiate athletics that reported directly to the president and a few other things, but all other units. So I had to, was responsible for the schools, the libraries, the computing centers, uh, the regional campuses. The, the regional campuses the, as well. Yeah, I was responsible for the regional campuses. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the, the, the uh, John Hicks was responsible for legislative relations reported directly to the president and also private fundraising reported directly to the president it was for the succession of vice presidents for, for uh, fund fundraising development, and, uh, development. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I, I, I think that probably this is a pretty good setup probably the president should have three people report to him somebody on the academic side somebody from Fiscal said somebody responsible for the outside world, fundraising, the legislature, and so forth. And I think that each of them is supposed to push in their direction, the direction of what they're supposed to represent. And the president can make up his mind which way he's going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, and uh, that worked very well. And, uh, uh, and, uh, What, um, what, let me just ask a question. The regional campuses, they, did they grow um, during that time? And they, they grew. The, I'm not convinced that the regional campus system is good for the state of Indiana. I think that uh, 50 years ago, or 60 years ago, maybe 70 years ago, Indiana and Purdue started these regional campuses. Uh, I'm not sure that from the point of view of the public, a strong system of junior colleges where people are fed into all the main campuses a theater. wouldn't be better. Where you have essentially three research campuses by now, uh, Indianapolis, Bloomington, and Lafayette, uh, some major teachers' colleges, Boston State and Indiana State, and then the system of junior colleges. The state of California has so a system like this, that the university, university system, the okay. state college system, and the junior college system. Very, very large. And it, it works reasonably well, I think. Uh, but we now, we, we now have the, the, the regional campuses, and so they work quite well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, uh, and they've become, they're, they're doing grown. a lot of good things for the people. And they've grown a lot. Too, they've grown they? a lot. Right. They've grown more really since I stepped out, I think. It's, mm -hmm. They've grown more recent, recently, in recent years. And I think the, the and, and in fact, in fact, of course, now some of the junior college functions being taken over by Ivy Tech. So and I think the system is in relatively good shape. But I think Indiana has a, still a low percentage of its high school graduates go to college. And I would look at this as the problem that we don't really have a, a well-developed system of junior colleges that it's takes okay. people into the other places. Yeah. I think at least, and, uh, and then I, well, uh, uh, I, I, mean, I became provost in '74, and was, I was dean for 12 years from '62 to '74, and then provost from '74 to '86. Then I retired and went back into the Department of Mathematics. And then what? And you've been doing some teaching. Tell us what what you've been. You were doing some teaching since. Yeah, I taught. I, I taught uh, until eight, I taught I was on the faculty until eighty one, officially. And then I was seventy and I had to retire. At that time, I had to retire at seventy. Okay. But I continued teaching, of course, a semester as a volunteer because I just liked the kids. And then I think that. Uh, in that sense, I, I, was a, I think I was a good fit for Purdue because I had been a student at MIT and 
I like engineering students, I, and I like um, um, I like the kind of kids we get here. We are uh, students in the Ivy League school sort of think of themselves as an elite. They're arrogant. You see. We get some of very bright kids, although they know that they're very bright, uh, who come from small town and. Uh, Engineering typically is a profession that does not attract the children of the very rich. It's a profession that attracts lower middle class kids. And I like working with lower middle class kids. They're very pleasant and very interesting. Yeah. And uh, I've taught everything in mathematics. When I first came here to all kinds of graduate courses where we didn't have a anybody in that field. Has the graduate enrollment increased since you've been over time since you've been here, do you find? Yeah, it has gone up, but mm -hmm. no, no. But the, the graduate enrollment, uh, my guess, is, has not grown as, 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 as much percentage-wise as the undergraduate enrollment. I don't know the numbers of that, of that. Okay. I think that's the case. The, the, but we, we get some very good graduate students in Purdue also. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, uh, Can I ask you, you've got a, um, any favorite memory of Purdue that you'd like to share with us? Or long time or outstanding or something for the researchers that might be in? I think you've addressed some of them. You would like working with. I like working with people, and I like, yeah. uh, um, uh, and I, I hope that I made some good decisions. And those would be, would be gratifying, of course. I, I when I was on the, uh, when I was provost, we worked with, uh, I worked with some very good people again. surrounded myself, and maybe this comes back to something I said earlier, I always surrounded myself when I was provost with people with a base, an academic base. I mean, when I had Bob Grinko and Strasa and met, they were vice presidents, but they still had research support in their own departments. And the virtue of this is that when you have people have a base, uh, they, they can tell, say no to you. They'll be frank, because they, they, they don't have to be afraid of you. And I think this is a, I was just recently, recently read a book about Peter Drucker, and he emphasized that, I was surprised what he said, what he said was about industry, but it's really true in university too, that the only people that are having are people who need you less than you need them, and, and those people are going to be independent, they're going to tell you the truth, and, but that's how you get good ideas, because very often, you know, you talk to people, and you eventually adopt their view. And and actually this works out very well. When you adopt your view, you win in two ways. First of all, you now have a good idea. But secondly, they are pleased when they hear you express the views that they first gave you. It works out very well. And I learned from all these people who surrounded me, I suppose. Right. Darlene Hine is another one I remember with a, with a very fine historian. Right, right. Yeah. And he worked with Bob, with Dr. Ringo. I know Ringo quite well. Yes. Uh, uh, Luther Williams, I don't know if you remember him, he was a biologist. Right, yes. was an associate right. provost and then went on to become a graduate dean at Washington University in St. Louis. And okay. Then he was vice president of Colorado and then he became university president. And uh, so. Uh, it's nice to follow their, you know, when they leave. You know, the, the threads. You feel the impact you make is on the institution, but also on people. And I'm not sure what's more fun, really, the the people who you feel that you have helped along the way, or the institute, whatever you've done for. But sometimes you get a more lasting feeling from that, you know, as as it you yeah, sort of goes through goes through you. Yeah, yeah. you 
you reminisce and you think about it. Yeah, yeah. Times, and interact. And, and, uh, and how about, well, let me ask you one, another thing. You got, the hall was named after you. Did that come, how did that come about? Were you surprised? Well, I was very surprised and I was very gratified that uh, I, you know, I was, uh, the, the, the president called me, said they wanted to have a building after me, and I, uh, no, I, I, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I mean, as I said, I was surprised, but secondly, I was very pleased with it. I can't pretend I'm not yeah. pleased with it. Right. And I uh, and, uh, enjoyed it. And I, when, when I had been in dedication, my three children came and their families. And, uh, Where do your children live? Well, unfortunately, they're all far away. They are, uh, one is in Massachusetts, one is in New York, one is in New Jersey. For a long time, I had one in San Francisco, which I like, because I like visiting San Francisco, but that's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, of course, much of what I did would have not, would, was related to my late life Violet, who was a professor of electrical engineering. I mean, I think of the impact he had of the institution, it was really a joint impact, not just my impact, I think. Did any of your children go into academia at all? No. no. I, actually, two of my children got PhDs, but they're not working in universities. The third one is, is a dark physician. The one in Massachusetts is a physician. Mm -hmm. well, that's nice. My daughter, uh, well, all my children wanted to be different from their parents. I think that's true of most children, since most of their parents have been in sort of quantitative scientific they were still to be different. But they all then found out that their genes were stronger than their rebellion. So they ended up with feeling such a qualitative stuff. Interesting. Uh, my, my younger son is a PhD engineer from Berkeley, who's in New Jersey. Uh -huh. yeah. He has a very nice family. And, uh, so he has some grandchildren. He has seven grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And my daughter, got a PhD at MIT from Sloan, a management school in economics, joint degree in economics and management, and she, uh, she first joined a composite company, she joined a consulting company and uh, uh, became the, the first woman partner at McKenzie Company. Okay. And then she became a woman partner in the New York office, she was the first in the Cleveland office, and became a woman partner in the New York office. But then she got married uh, after I did the second time when she, and I, when I, after my, when I, when I died, my daughter said, Dad, you, Dad, I can live by myself, but you can't, you have to get married again. <laughs> but then you know, she got married too eventually. <laughs> and uh, then she had the whole consulting company and then eventually sold it. And, uh, writing books now and doing other things. Okay. And raising two children. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and do you do any, have you done any traveling at all since you, in your retirement? Well, I have been, in the recent years I haven't, I haven't done any travel except mm -hmm. to go to visit the children and we like, we like Door County in Wisconsin. I've gone up there. Not, I didn't go up this year, but until this year I went up every summer to Door County which I consider the most beautiful place within uh, 700 miles from Lafayette. If you, if you go beyond 700 miles, you have the rockers and stuff. But, <laughs> Good uh, point. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the, and we've gone there in the year. Uh, but uh, probably it's getting harder for me. Uh, yes. I'm 86. And, uh, and, uh, so, uh, but, uh, Anything that I didn't ask that you'd like to? share in closing anything that you thought that you think about? I think you covered it very well, your experiences. Well, I may mean, just want to say that I mentioned you earlier that you have to have a, a clear vision of what you're doing. Right. And when I was provost, and this was the vision that I shared with uh, Dr. Hans and Fred Ford, we, we thought of Purdue as a, as a, as a distinguished, uh, technically biased land-grant university. And that needs to be fighting. A university needs to have strong humanities and sciences, otherwise you're not a university. The core has to be strong. 
but you say technically biased. You know, for instance, in England you have Cambridge and Oxford. C Cambridge is the technically biased one. They have the Cavendish lab and so on. Oxford is more traditional. You know, so technically biased like university. Uh, university of course, that means you do so. Land grant means that you do not just serve the top five or ten percent of the population. It's different from MIT or Caltech. We as, uh, our job is to serve a large fraction of the population. Right. And technically bias means that you don't have, only means it refers to professional programs, not the core programs. You don't have professional programs in all the social sciences. Like we don't have a school of social work and stuff like that. On the other hand, you have a full array of professional programs in the technical fields. And uh, I mean, that was my vision of the university. And my goal was, you know, when I was provost, my goal was to be, to be, I had goals for different parts. In agriculture, I thought we should be the best, we were trying to be the best Midwestern university. In the humanities, I felt we should be as good, we should aim to be as good as anybody in the Big Ten. That was the goal, to be like Wisconsin or Michigan. In, in science, my goal was to be second best to the University of Chicago in the Midwest. Uh, you know, and in, in engineering, my goal was to be as good as anybody in the Midwest. So I had specific goals that fit the mission that I saw for the university. Right. Right. And uh, and I think when you have that and you're open about it, you tell everybody about it, it makes it helps in, the, in dealing with the faculty, it helps with fundraising, it helps in the relations various people you're dealing with. If, you're not, if you yourself are not clear what you want, you, you can't ex explain it to anybody. That's right, exactly. And good point. And, uh, Very good. Okay. I didn't succeed in Rumble 6, but I tried. You did. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Ah. This concludes it.